with my co-authors, Kevin Hoffman, and uh, two of my awesome advisor, Patrick Uxter and Matthias Payer at Purdue University. So I guess this paper will be the only paper in this session that is not attacking the kernel. Um, this work is about strict threat isolation for C or C++ multi-threaded applications. So what are the problems of today's software? Today's software is typically multi-threaded. It has numerous components running um, within the same process area space. What makes this situation a security nightmare is that um, some of these components could be developed by various third parties. Therefore, uh, when a targeted application is, um, is a multi-threaded application, all these software components are unconditionally trusted, even if they shouldn't be. So to pr provide isolation um, for software components, one could use process to isolate uh, program data, but that requires the programmer to completely redesign the legacy software. Um, another popular solution is um, based on software fault isolation, which could cause various delays um, due to the, uh, the software monitor, depending on the uh, actual implementation techniques. So here we use a simple example to illustrate the isolation problem in a single process address space. Imagine this green box to be the address space of a Firefox web browser. Within its process address space, this Firefox instance stores program secrets such as um, users' passwords or credit card information. And they shouldn't be accessed by other irrelevant software components. But the browser could load modules to enhance its functionalities. Um, low, uh, low plugins to access privileged resources such as um, like physical devices on the system, like webcam, and use um, various libraries for domain-specific applications, or even um, enable microservices for even more fancy features. As the browser adds more and more components to the same address space, it increases the chance of being compromised. You know, it takes only one compo component to be compromised to exploit the entire program. So this problem is due to the intrinsically shared single process address space and the lack of intra-process isolation. So one can use process to isolate the software components. You might be thinking, for example, Google's Chrome web browser um, uses a multi-process architecture to isolate uh, the browser resources. But in general, process isolation has its own drawbacks. For example, uh, non-trivial IPC increases the code complexity and sometimes performance um, overhead. And also there is a lot of um, resource duplication at the system level. Um, Cross-process cross synchronization can also be a headache for the programmers. And most importantly, it is extremely difficult to overhaul programs with large code base to use process isolation. If we could safely bring all these process address spaces together and therefore remove the expensive IPC, programmers will be able to selectively um, isolate process memory and have an efficient and secure partially shared memory pool. So the ability uh, to selectively isolate the process memory allows the program to eliminate IPC and to share as many resources as possible at the system, system level and the program could assume threat synchronization still works. And because of the shared memory assumption, the code changes are minimal in terms of uh, memory access and data sharing. So efficient and secure intra-process isolation is the motivation of our work. Our goal here is to um, provide a programmer with a programming abstraction to selectively isolate process memory with several properties. Uh, we believe that in order for a security tool um, to be widely and quickly adapted, a tool needs to be flexible so that no matter the client or the server-side applications can take advantage of it. Second, we think that um, a tool, a, a new tool, should be extremely easy to use without the need for the programmer to um, overhaul the legacy software. Also, a tool that does not require hardware modifications or any specific hardware uh, means that it is ready to be deployed on commodity systems. Last but not least, um, a tool should not sacrifice parallelism when providing security. It should guarantee the security of the software without serializing the execution. So to address these challenges, um, we propose secure memory views, we call the SMVs. Uh, which allow the programmer to selectively isolate process address space based on user-defined policy. We define three abstractions to manage 
process memory and achieve intra-process isolation. First, we define a memory protection domain to be a contiguous range of virtual memory addresses. Second, we define a, a secure, mem secure memory view as a thread container with a collection of memory protection domains. An SMV defines whether threads could read, write, execute, or allocate data to a set of memory protection domains. Finally, we create a special thread called SMV threads that strictly follows the privilege defined by SMVs. So here's a high, a high level overview of what SMVs look like. There are five memory domains and four SMV threads in this example. Um, and thread T4 is using two memory domains. Suppose that the attacker compromised a thread T3 executing in memory domain L. So this is what the memory domains look like in the program's virtual address, address space. The compromised thread T3 is isolated by SMV3 that can only access, uh, only access memory pages in memory domain L. It is not, it is not possible for T3 to access the, the memory pages in memory domain S uh, that stores the program secret, even though they are just threads uh, living within the same process address space. Therefore, the memory isolation um, in SMVs is per thread isolation. So SMV is really easy to use. The programmer just need to link the SMV library when compiling the source code and include the header file. Uh, just to give a really simple example of how to use SMV with some of the basic API calls. So first we can create uh, a memory domain that, and store program secrets in that domain. Then we create an SMV container and we make the SMV join the memory domain. So there's a mapping recorded in the system. In order to access data in that memory domain, we need to grant permission to the SMV. So here we allow SMV1 to read data in memory domain one, but nothing else. Finally, we create an SMV thread that is isolated by SMV1. And after the SMV thread finishes its job, uh, we join the thread and make the SMV leave the domain. And finally kill the SMV and kill the memory domain from the system. So when a memory domain is killed from a system, um, its memory regions are automatically unmapped. So this privilege setup might be a little inconvenient in terms of refactoring the legacy software. So we provide an easier way for the programmer to minimize the, the code refactoring effort. The SMV API could automatically intercept malloc or, uh, and uh, pthread create calls and replace them with a set of SMV equivalent functions. Um, therefore, a programmer only um, needs to add two lines of code to the program, one for the header file and another one for initializing the main program. So in, in this library assisted setup, each P thread transparently becomes an SMB thread and will receive a private domain for its private stacks initially. So the programmer could assume that um, threads are isolated from each other. In addition, thread local memory allocation happens automatic automatically in the thread's private domain that is um, not accessible by other threads. Um, in the case where threads um, need to share data, the programmer could create a shared memory domain and carefully control the access privilege. So, so far we've talked about how to use SMVs from uh, user space. We implemented the SMV API in user space for about 800 lines of code. But what's really managing the memory views and um, enforcing the memory reference is actually in the kernel space that we implemented with uh, about 2,000 lines of code in our Linux kernel prototype. We've added SMV kernel module for a user space program to communicate with the kernel. The SMV metadata management manages the overall per process isolation setup. Uh, we also uh, we manipulate the page table for threads to isolate their memory space and utilize the page fault handler as a software monitor that traps all the illegal memory access. So let's dive right into the kernel. In a current Linux kernel, each process has one MM struct to describe its memory space. Um, here the MM in MM struct means uh, memory management. A process child threads use the same MM struct, so they are seeing exactly the same virtual memory with the same privilege. For our metadata management, we added several data structures to record the per process isolation setup in the kernel space. 
Uh, the most important ones are Memdom struct and SMV struct. They record the privilege setup and virtual address mapping with privilege information inside the kernel. So you will notice um, each SMV uses one page table. So let me describe how we separate uh, the page tables in the next slide. So this is how the original Linux kernel manages the process and its threads uh, memory space. So there are three threads in this example. They all share the same page table and the mem memory management related data metadata. But in SMVs, we don't want threads to have a global access to the entire process address space. Therefore, we need to separate their page tables. Um, all threads should uh, still mutually agree on the process address space, but with different page tables, threads are actually accessing the same virtual address with different permissions. So with this memory management, we could allow thread one to read and write to the protected region. And thread two could only read, while thread three has no permission to access the region at all. So this partially shared memory uh, space has several benefits. For example, it allows legacy thread synchronization that utilizes MM struct in the kernel to continue to work with M SMV seamlessly. And it also allows debugging tools such as um, Velgrind to attach to an SMV program because um, we, don't, we don't use clone syscall in the, in the API to create a completely different process address space. Uh, which breaks the single process address space assumption for a lot of debugging tools like Velgrind or GDB. Um, and most importantly, uh, we found that sharing the same MM shock could uh, avoid many kernel um, synchronization for MM related data structure. And we discuss this more details in the paper. So once we have this page table set up separately, um, we need to check the privilege. So we check the privilege in the page fault handler. When a pay, uh, we're handling a page fault, the original Linux kernel only checks um, whether a memory access is valid by determining if a given memory area is mapped in a system or not. If the region is not mapped, a segmentation fault signal will be delivered to the program that triggered the page fault. Uh, if an access memory region is mapped or is fixable, the kernel will proceed to prepare the page and the same instruction is executed again. To facilitate intra-process isolation, we added additional privilege checks just before the kernel actually proceed to fix the page fault. So the added privilege checks are marked in a, in a gray box. Our privilege checks first make sure that, th make sure the thread type, if the fault is generated by an SMV threads, it further checks whether the SMV is actually running in the SMV that has the privilege to access the memory domain containing the fault address. If the fault passes all checks, then um, the SMV kernel will perform demand paging to fix the fault. Otherwise, the, the SMV kernel sends a segmentation fault signal to the faulty SMV thread to block underprivileged access. So we evaluated our SMV's prototype on an Intel machine with four cores and 16 gigabytes of RAM running on or running our modified Linux kernel based on a fairly recent release. Uh, we compiled all the benchmarks into two versions, as P threads versus SMV threads. The benchmarks we used are Parsec, Firefox web browser, Cherokee, and Apache web servers. Um, all these experiments we showed in the paper can be reproduced on system running on today's x86 hardware. So before we run the benchmarks to measure the performance, uh, we need, first need to make sure that um, our modif modifications didn't actually break the correctness of Linux kernel. So to do so, we tested our SMV kernel with a set of testing scripts in a Linux test project. So the Linux test project contains over 500 shell scripts and, uh, and stress testing uh, for stress testing the Linux kernel. Specific test suites including IO test, stress test, uh, network related tests, IO, control, sysfs, procfs, interfaces, and various kernel subsystems, including the memory subsystem, of course. Um, the, the SMV kernel was able to pass all of these stress tests, and we didn't obse observe any system errors or kernel panic. So for evaluation, for all the benchmarks and applications we used, we created M plus one memory protection domains, um, where N is the number of threads, and the, and the additional memory domain is actually a global pool for threads to securely share data. 
This default policy enforces strict threat isolation and prevents threats from uh, cross cross uh, referencing each other's each other's uh, private memory domains, such as uh, threat private stacks or um, threat private heap. With, so with the default policy, we first uh, look at Parsec, which includes 12 applications with different, in different uh, applications domains. For example, machine learning, compression, decompression, or um, graphics kind of workload. And all of these applications, they are all multi-threaded with complex threat interaction and memory operations. Although it's not necessary to protect uh, the security of Parsec benchmarks because they are just benchmark programs without program secret, but we used Parsec to show that um, SMBs can protect threats private stack for different applications with intensive and parallel memory operations. So there are 12, app, uh, 12 benchmarks, and the last bar is the average overhead. The overall performance overhead is around 2%, and we added only two lines of code to each of the benchmarks. So to test real-world applications, first we look at multi-threaded web servers. Um, we chose Cherokee because it uses per-thread memory buffer to isolate threats from uh, remote connections. The SMV's version of the web browser um, is able to automatically handle threat isolation with only two lines of code changes. Um, the server has 40 threads by default to handle the incoming requests concurrently, and we use standard Apache Bench to send 100,000 requests with concurrency levels set to four and measure the runtime overhead. Um, the results suggest that the security enhanced Cherokee server does not incur more than 1% of uh, runtime overhead in all cases. And we've also ran experiments with Apache HTTPD web, web server with even a uh, larger file size up to uh, one gigabytes, and uh, the overhead stays below 1%. So finally, we look at whether SMVs will work on practical and more complex software such as web browser that requires strong resource isolation. The original uh, Firefox already isolates resource for different tabs using the concept of compartments. Um, however, the isolation boundaries of these compartments are only logical, meaning that um, there's no uh, isolation guarantee if there's a memory bug that could be exploited by an adversary. Um, our default policy ensures that each SMV threat receives a, re receives a private memory domain and protect the threat's private stack. Um, in fact, Firefox has launched a multi-process project and tried to achieve process per tab isolation. But to the best of our knowledge, um, this project has been going on for years, and process per tab isolation is still not there for Firefox. Um, but it, it, is a it is possible to achieve good performance and strong isolation at the same time using process isolation. Google Chrome is a good example of it. Um, but software such as Google Chrome requires tremendous engineering effort and resources. So for, for legacy software like Firefox, to use uh, process isolation, the software needs to be completely redesigned, which is, I think, which is one of the reasons why Firefox is still not yet process per tab. As an alternative for process per tab Firefox, we used uh, SMVs to protect Firefox JavaScript engine, SpiderMonkey, and introduced a new threat type called uh, SMB threats to Firefox. We were able to add uh, 12 lines of code changes and achieve strong isolation for compartments. And we ran four different JavaScript benchmarks available online and measured the runtime overhead. Each benchmark contains about 20 to 40 workloads. Although this, these benchmarks are designed to be ran in its own tab, the SMVs traps uh, each page fault to check the threat's access privilege. The result indicates that um, the overall performance overhead is about 2%, and we believe our prototype could be practical for production software. So to summarize, we proposed a programming abstraction with kernel level implementation called SMVs for intra process isolation. SMVs allows the programmer to selectively isolate process memory for threats so that a malicious fault domain uh, cannot compromise other benign ones. 
Uh, we believe SMVs are flexible and easy to use. It's flexible as we've shown that we were able to use SMVs on different software from desktop web browser to backend web servers. And it's easy to use because the evaluation showed that SMVs require at most 12 lines of code changes to legacy software with um, 13 million lines of code. Uh, that's the Firefox case study. And SMBs rely on commodity hardware, so no FPGA or special hardware is needed. Lastly, SMBs run low runtime overhead in various uh, benchmarks and real world applications should show that this protection mecha mechanism could, pre uh, could become a fairly practical solution for intra process um, isolation problem. That concludes my talk. The SMV prototype is publicly available on GitHub. Uh, you're welcome to try the system out. I'm sure that the prototype is now perfect, so feel free to contact me if you have interesting ideas on how to improve the prototype and on any spin-off projects. Thank you. I'll take questions. Questions? So. First of all, I'd, I'd like, yes. it's really great that you're making this available. This is uh, good stuff. Um, there's a question on this side. Um, so you've been, you kind of build this as a solution to the memory corruption exploit problem, but it seems like it's also a useful software reliability um, benefit of being able to isolate threads when you don't need to share memory, and I wonder if you've thought about making your library available to use in other programming languages besides memory unsafe ones like C. Um, actually, we had, a, we had previous projects that's um, implementing the pretty similar programming model and supports Java. So we actually have Java in C. But um, the one with the kernel modification, with, it has really low overhead because of this hardware page table bit supports. And yeah, so Java is available from our group. Yeah. Name and affiliation, please. Uh, I'm Mike Petullo from the uh, United States Military Academy. Um, I want to ask, so one of the disadvantages of the multiple page tables is you flush your TLB a lot. Yes. Um, I actually was surprised by results. I would have thought there would be a little bit more overhead associated with that. So I, I guess what I'm asking, did you do any experiments to actually isolate how much of that overhead was actually due to the now flushing the TLB more? So we don't have the exact number for TLB flush, but our process doesn't have this tag TLB feature. So whenever there's a, there's a, Context switch when you load a CR, CR3 register, you have to flush all the TLB yep. entries. Yeah, so the performance overhead is in, included in the numbers. And I think if you have, if you have uh, an application that's, that's constantly allocating a huge chunk of memory, and a lot of threads are accessing it in parallel, and then free them all at once, and then allocate again, then the performance will be bad. But it will be also true for general purpose, uh, general application without the SMVs because you are doing this constant. As you're switching between processes. Yeah, yeah. You'd be switching more often. Yeah. With, okay. But it, it, I mean, it's good results. I'm just surprised it's, it's great that your performance is so low despite that, so. Thanks. Your performance is so good with persistence despite that. Hi. Uh, Stan Volkart, UC Irvine. Uh, so I was wondering, what is the default behavior of your malloc wrapper? Do allocations automatically become thread local, or are they global? So there are thread. If you use the library assisted setup, it's automatically uh, thread local. So when we actually create a thread, we don't use clone Cisco. We use p thread create calls, mm -hmm. and then we set up a, a region for the thread stack, and then tag that as a private domain. So all all so all the subsequent memory allocations will be tagged. And what happens if threads want to share memory? Uh, I'm sorry. What happens if threads want to share memory? So you can allocate a, a shared memory domain. Mm -hmm. For example, you have 10 threads. You only want one, thread one and 10 to access the shared domain. You can do that. Doesn't a programmer have to manually specify yes. that memory? Yeah. Yes. So this, was, this will be a tool for a programmer to isolate their um, software. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Chang Oche from KAIST. Hi. I think there is a similar work called Shred, published in Oakland 2016. And actually, it has the uh, similar motivation, and it addressed the problem by isolating inner process components. And what's the advantage of your approach over, uh, uh, against others? So I'm not, 
super familiar with the you know, with the work you mentioned, but um, our work is different in ways such that we allow multiple threads to run in the same compartment and then do the memory allocation, deallocation in parallel. So that's why you can see in the Prosec benchmark, their, their overhead is pretty low. So most of the isolation um, solutions, they uh, did not run uh, multi-threaded ben uh, multi benchmarks such as Prosec. Most of the time is, um, I would say, spec. Spec is single-threaded. And uh, input size is pretty slow and uh, it's pretty small. And if you have a large chunk of memory allocated and you have multiple threads um, hitting the same em uh, memory area, then you will see the difference between our system and others. I think that's one of the main difference. But actually, Shred also provides multi-threading isolation. So I think uh, I cannot find the difference between this one and your work. So uh, as I mentioned, we uh, this is a, like um, a system supports parallel memory operation. So you can have one compartment that has one, uh, 100 threads processing the same job with the same permission and doing the memory allocation, deallocation in parallel. So uh, um, in our paper, we actually pointed out that previous systems in the second and the first generation, they, don't, they do not support this in, in, in fully support this in parallel. For example, they have this centralized memory allocator to tag each of the memory regions, but we don't have that. So that would be one of the major performance bottleneck. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, David Williams King from Columbia University. Hello. Two quick questions. First, what happens to the original um, thread stack the main was running on? Is that protected or? Yes, that's protected. Oh, cool. Because I was, I was thinking it would be great if you could take a memory region and convert it to be protected if it wasn't original. That's, a, that's, that's in your library assisted setup. So when you create a thread, it's automatically private. Great. Yeah. Um, second question. From a security perspective, if an attacker gains control over a thread, arbitrary code execution, is there a system call they can execute which will give that thread access to some other thread's compartment? That's a pretty good question. So I think um, we. Um, we intercepted those memory-related syscalls, for example, MMAP. So we have this, so in the kernel, we, I didn't mention that in the slides, but in the kernel, there's a VM area structure that's actually recording the regions allowing uh, threads to uh, touch. So we append a tag in that structure. And whenever we see that, okay, this, this memory area is actually used by SMV systems, then we, we block those syscalls. I just meant through the front door. Is In your interface, can one thread say, hey, I'd like to gain access to this other region? No, you have to have this. So you have a, you have a main thread to uh, grant permission to other threads. If you, if you deny grant permission, then that's I see. not possible. Thread can grant permissions. Yeah, so you have this master yeah. and managing all that. Thank you. Thank you. OK, if there are no further questions, I suggest we thank all of the three speakers. And that concludes this session. Thank you.